Crystal Faye Todd was born on January 4, 1974, in Conway, South Carolina, to parents Junior and Bonnie Todd. At the age of 17, she was a senior at a Conway, South Carolina high school, and as an early graduation gift, her mother, Bonnie Faye Todd, had given her a brand new 1991 Toyota Celica. On November 17, 1991, Crystal stopped in for her grandmother's birthday celebration and left about 7 p.m., kissing her mother goodbye and saying she was headed to the mall to meet her friends. Around 9 p.m., Crystal and a friend decided to go to a party in the Punch Bowl community where they stayed until 11 p.m. After dropping her friend off at home, Crystal rushed back to the mall to say goodbye to friends before her midnight curfew. But she never arrived home that night, and when midnight came and went, her mother became very concerned. At 3 a.m., Bonnie phoned police, and a dispatcher took her description along with the description of her car. He tried to reassure her it wasn't unusual for teens to show up late and that Bonnie should just let him know when her daughter got home. At 8 a.m., Bonnie was panicking and called 911. Next, she contacted her daughter's longtime close friend, Ken Register, who said that he hadn't seen Crystal all night and that he would check the local hospitals. Two of Crystal's friends had found her car parked at the Conway Middle School. An officer was dispatched to the location and found the car locked with Crystal's purse still inside. The officer tried to reassure her that Crystal was likely still out with friends and having too much fun to call or come home. But Bonnie knew that wasn't like Crystal, and she said she knew her daughter wasn't coming home. The next day, on November 18, 1991, two men were driving just outside of Conway in the Maple community when one of them noticed something odd lying in the ditch along the road. Getting out for a closer inspection, the men realized it was a female body. The scene was gruesome, and she was found to have been sexually assaulted. Her mother, a widow, was inconsolable. She told police that she was certain that Crystal's killer was someone she knew. Investigators believed the same thing, especially when they learned that she would have never gotten into a vehicle with someone she didn't know. Criminal profilers predicted that the killer would be an angry young white male who was confident the law wouldn't catch him, and he was probably a friend of the victim. Police asked 51 of Crystal's male friends and acquaintances if they would give DNA samples and they all agreed. Crystal's friends, including longtime friend Ken Register, were there for Bonnie through the entire ordeal. Ken and Crystal had grown up together and remained close friends, and even Bonnie had always been fond of him. He was a shoulder for Bonnie to cry on and someone to rant to. However, before she was murdered, the friendship between Crystal and Ken had taken a turn for the worse. Crystal had confided in Bonnie that Ken had propositioned her for sex, despite the fact that he had a girlfriend and she had been appalled by this. The two had dated briefly in their early teens, but then decided to return to being close friends again. There had also been serious warning signs about Ken in the previous years. When he was 15, he made an obscene phone call to a grown woman and described in sickening detail how he wanted to mutilate and kill her. When it was his turn to be interviewed by police, he hesitantly but willingly provided his DNA, but the lab was backlogged and it would be a couple months before they got to all the DNA samples collected from the citizens. Then on February 15, 1992, the lab notified the police that they had a DNA match, Ken Register. Register eventually broke down and confessed to the crime. He told investigators a story that is very likely untrue. He told them on the night Crystal died, they had unprotected consensual sex. Ken said when he didn't use protection, Crystal became furious and threatened to cry rape if she became pregnant. Ken said he became outraged at Crystal's screaming and insults, and before he realized what he was doing, he was stabbing her. Ken told investigators when he came to his senses and realized what he'd done, he panicked. He pulled Crystal from his car, tossed her into the ditch, threw away the knife, and hurried home. Crystal's car keys and other evidence was found located at the register home. Bonnie was shocked that she had been duped by Ken, who even served as a pallbearer at her daughter's funeral. 
After Register's arrest, it was discovered he had been arrested in September 1991 for exposing himself to a couple of teenage girls after asking them for directions. The charges were still pending when he was arrested for Crystal's murder. In September 1992, Register was tried on the indecent exposure charges and quickly found guilty. Then in early 1993, jurors found him guilty for Crystal's death, his sexual misconduct, kidnapping, and torture. Ken Register was sentenced to life in prison and remains incarcerated at the Broad River Prison in Columbia, South Carolina. There are reportedly many friends and family members of Crystal's who continue to write to and attend parole hearings any time he is eligible. Despite being sentenced to two life sentences, he was eligible for parole in February 2022, but he waived his right to face the parole board. Nearly 2,700 people signed a petition asking that his parole not be granted. He will be eligible to face the parole board again in 2024. Her mother, Bonnie, passed away in 2014 and is buried next to her daughter in Conway. The petition to keep this monster behind bars where he belongs is at change.org and I will put the link in the description. Yanira Sidias was born on March 3, 1992, and by the age of 30, she was a mother of three young children and described as vibrant and lively with a big smile. On March 4, 2022, Yanira was celebrating her 30th birthday at a local casino. After the celebration, her ex-boyfriend, Juan Gastelum, picked her up and took her back to his apartment. This was the last time she was ever seen alive. After going missing, Moses Lake Police called Yanira's phone to see if someone would answer. A man believed to be her ex, Gastelum, answered the phone. This information led police to question Gastelum. Allegedly, after they arrived at his apartment, Gastelum murdered Yanira and then took photos of himself sexually assaulting her. He then left the apartment with her body. Her family, with help of volunteers and community members, started searching several locations for Yanira's remains. Over two months later, on May 12th, detectives received data from Gastelum's cell phone, leading them to where he went after leaving the apartment that night, which was a remote area off Highway 12, just outside Wallula Junction, Washington. When authorities arrived at the location, they found her body in a sleeping bag covered with tree limbs and leaves. At this time, the medical examiner has not released the details on how Yanira died. However, Moses Lake Police say that they found a large hunting knife that Gastelum threw away at a gas station and cadaver dogs detected human blood on it. He was arrested days later in Oregon but fought extradition for two months before finally being extradited back to Washington State. He was charged with second-degree murder and second-degree rape following disturbing photos found on his cell phone. Documents also say Gastelum admitted to being physically abusive to Yanira. As two physical domestic calls were referenced from October 2021 and January 2022. On October 4, 2021, Yanira even requested a police report to get a restraining order against Gastelum. Gastelum had pleaded not guilty to both charges, and his next court appearance is scheduled for July 5, 2022. Yanira's three young children now live with their grandmother, Yanira's mother Anna, and they deeply miss their mommy. On January 4, 1996, a woman called 911 and reported that a black man had broken into her apartment located at 2205 North Broadway Street in Santa Ana, California, and was stabbing her boyfriend. When police arrived, they found 22-year-old Christopher Hervey with multiple stab wounds. Tragically, Christopher would later die from his injuries. His girlfriend, Jade Benning, who he shared the apartment with, would tell police that she woke up at 3 a.m. to find Christopher struggling with the intruder. She said she tried to help but was slashed in the hand. Investigators would also speak with the neighbors, who told police they'd heard a loud argument inside the apartment before police arrived. 
Detectives for this case told reporters at the time that it seemed like it was an attempted burglary gone wrong and nobody was arrested. The case went cold until January 2020 when investigators received an anonymous letter implicating Jade Benning for the murder of Christopher Hervey. After reopening the case, investigators found forensic evidence linking her to the crime. So on May 3, 2022, 26 years after his death, Benning, now a mother of three, was arrested by the Marshall's Lone Star Fugitive Task Force near her home in Austin, Texas, and charged with his murder. In 1986, Michelle Welch was 12 years old and lived in Tacoma, Washington. On March 26, 1986, a babysitter allowed Michelle and her two younger sisters to ride their bikes to the nearby Puget Park in Tacoma. When they arrived, they realized they left their lunches, so Michelle rode her bike back home and then returned with their lunches. When she returned, she chained her bike next to one of her sister's bikes, set the lunches on the table, and went looking for her siblings, who had gone to a nearby business to use the restroom because there wasn't any at the park. When Michelle's sisters returned to the park, they didn't see her, so they went and played near a cave under the bridge for another half an hour. When the sisters returned to the park, they found a brown paper bag with their lunches on the table, but still no Michelle. They called her name and started down a trail looking for her before their babysitter summoned them back. It was then determined that Michelle was missing. A classmate later told detectives that he saw a man in the park that day under the Proctor Bridge who kept watching the girls. Police were called to the park and began searching with a tracking dog. That night before midnight, the dog found her body in a makeshift fire pit area in the gulch. She had been beaten and sexually assaulted and died from a cut to the neck. DNA was collected and preserved, but unfortunately, there were no matches in the CODIS database. Parents of children in Tacoma would no longer allow their kids to ride their bikes or venture out as they had always done. Her murder would go unsolved for the next 30 years. In 2018, Parabon Nanolabs uploaded the suspect's DNA to GEDmatch, a public genetic genealogy database which permits searches of this type. Genetic genealogists then began building an in-depth family tree, narrowing the suspect to one of two brothers, Gary Charles Hartman. Both brothers had lived in Tacoma, Washington when Michelle was murdered. The pair was placed under police surveillance, and officers eventually followed Gary Hartman into a restaurant where they obtained a napkin he had used and discarded. Lo and behold, the DNA matched the DNA from the crime scene. 70-year-old Gary Hartman was charged with her rape and murder and sentenced to more than 26 years in prison. At his sentencing, he told his own family that he was sorry. According to reports, Hartman was working as a community nurse specialist at Western State Hospital and had a clean criminal record. However, Michelle wasn't the only young girl murdered in Tacoma in 1986. Within months of her murder, 13-year-old Jennifer Bastian was also murdered. It was always believed that their killers were likely the same person as their slayings were very similar and both had been innocently riding their bikes through the city parks. But in 2016, Parabon Nano Labs created a snapshot phenotype report to the task force, which showed that although both men were Caucasian, the suspect in Michelle's case had 9% Northern Native American admixture and Jennifer's killer did not, meaning they were not the same person. Jennifer's killer, 66-year-old Robert Washburn, was also caught using information provided to investigators by genetic genealogists. Just like Hartman, Washburn was caught after a paper napkin was collected that he had been using at a restaurant, allowing them to collect his DNA. The DNA from the napkin matched the DNA that was collected from the crime scene in 1986. These two innocent girls' murders prompted a new bill called Jennifer and Michelle's Law. Signed into law in 2019 by Governor Jay Inslee, the bill sought to expand law enforcement's DNA database and allows detectives to obtain DNA samples from deceased sex offenders.
Here is an update to a cold case that I featured in a previous main video that has been recently solved. On the morning of December 7, 1985, in Frenchville, Maine, Armand and Lorraine Pelletier's Siberian Husky was led outside to relieve himself in the freezing temperatures and returned ever so gently holding a deceased newborn baby. Shocked, the couple took the baby in and called police. It was discovered that a woman gave birth just 700 feet from the home. She then left the infant in the snow and below zero temperatures. Upon leaving, she left tire prints in the snow. Police told them the newborn baby may have lived up to 30 minutes in the 30 below temperatures. The couple was never able to have children of their own and said had the baby survived, they would have loved to adopt her. Nearly 37 years later, on June 13, 2022, Maine State Police detectives traveled to Lowell, Massachusetts to arrest the mother of baby Jane Doe. Using genetic genealogy, DNA, and many years of hard work, the suspect was finally identified. The mother was identified as 58-year-old Leanne Daigle, formerly Leanne Garrett of Lowell, Massachusetts. She was quickly charged with the infant's murder, but has pleaded not guilty. At the age of 21, Daigle reportedly drove to a gravel pit in Frenchville and gave birth to a baby girl. She alleges that she had no clue that she was pregnant, and on the night of December 6, 1985, she was driving home from work when she had the sudden urge to urinate. She pulled to the side of the road and gave birth and believed the infant was stillborn and left blocking out what had just occurred. A couple weeks later, she and her new boyfriend moved in together in New Hampshire where he was offered a new job. They had met at a July 4th celebration five months before she gave birth. They later married in 1987 and had two daughters and was reportedly a good mom to her daughters. The same technique used to find Leanne was used to find the biological father of the baby. He is now in an assisted living facility in Florida and unable to speak or communicate. One of Leanne's daughters had an in-depth conversation with her mother after she was arrested. Daigle said she had blocked out the memory and didn't recall anything about it until the police showed up to her door telling her she was the mother of an infant found dead decades earlier. It was determined she likely became pregnant on her 21st birthday but does not remember what happened the night of her birthday and did not recognize the name of the baby's father. She stated she suspects that she was drugged and raped. Her new boyfriend, who would later become her husband, stated if he had known she was pregnant at the time they started dating, that he would have wanted her to keep the baby and have them raise it together. He said that if she knew about the pregnancy, she may have hid it out of fear that he would leave her. At first, detectives did not believe that Daigle could have given birth without help and suspected John Daigle, her then boyfriend of several months, had assisted her. John said he produced a college transcript showing that he was in Orano in early December finishing school, and a roommate from the time sent police an email backing up his alibi. This will definitely be a case to continue to watch. Jody Loomis was born June 5, 1952, and at the age of 20, she was living in Bethel, Washington at 20 Winesap Road. On August 23, 1972, she was innocently riding her bicycle from her home to a stable on Stroomy Road to visit and ride her horse, Saudi, which was several miles away. She was last seen alive riding north on North Road to 164th Street Southeast by a girl working at a fruit stand. That girl saw her crossing the Bethel Everett Highway and riding up the hill on what was then called Penny Creek Road at about 5 p.m. About 30 minutes later, a couple who was driving up a secluded dirt road to Penny Creek Road, which is now Mill Creek Road, found Jody's partially nude body. She was still alive, but had been tragically shot twice and sexually assaulted. They placed her into their sob sonnet and was sadly pronounced dead on arrival to the hospital. It was determined that she had likely been shot with a 22 caliber weapon. Also, the bridle of her horse was missing from the crime scene, and her bicycle had been thrown down a steep embankment. 
her murder would go unsolved for the next 46 years. In 2008, a state crime lab technician discovered a tiny semen stain on Jody's boot that had previously gone unnoticed. This DNA would be used years later to begin a new investigation using genetic genealogy performed by Paramount Nano Labs and genetic genealogist Deb Stone. After the genealogist identified the parents of a possible suspect based on the family tree, police began to follow him. They would acquire a DNA sample from a discarded coffee cup he tossed in the trash while at the Tulalip Resort Casino. Washington State Patrol's crime lab confirmed that it positively matched the DNA profile from the crime scene and indeed belonged to 77-year-old Terrence Miller of Edmonds, Washington. In April 2019, Miller was arrested at his home by detectives with the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office and charged with her murder. Miller had a history of sex crimes dating back to the 1960s, including molesting young girls and indecent exposure. After he was let out on bond, he was found dead, presumably from suicide, while the jurors were deliberating. Three hours after his death, a jury convicted him of first-degree murder. Jody's brother, John Loomis, said he would have at least liked to see Miller go to prison after getting away with it for 48 long years. At the age of 30, Sherry Renee Herrera was a mother of four children living in Tulare, California. On March 30, 1993, Sherry had been dropped off at a rest area between Tulare and Pixley, California, and had arranged to be picked up in 10 minutes. This would be the last time she was seen alive. Just a few days later, her body was found in the desert along the I-10 freeway in Riverside County, California. DNA was collected from her body in the crime scene, and she had been sexually assaulted and strangled. Court records identify her as a known prostitute and drug user who worked the highway rest area in Tulare, California. With no leads, her case would go cold for the next three decades. In late May of 2022, Texas Rangers arrested 67-year-old Douglas Thomas at his home in Waco, Texas, for the murder of Shenda Denise Hayes. Shinda had been found murdered in Titus County, Texas, in April of 1992, and just like Sherry, Shinda was also a known prostitute. Thomas was connected by authorities to that murder by a DNA match to evidence obtained from the crime scene. Thomas had traveled extensively throughout the United States during his 40-plus years as a truck driver. Using genetic genealogy, a family tree was created, which led them to recently retired Thomas, likely being responsible for Sherry's death as well. Investigators traveled to Texas and interviewed Thomas about Sherry's homicide. His DNA was collected to verify that he was indeed the suspect they were looking for. Based on their investigation, he was charged with her rape and murder. Thomas remains in custody in Texas and will be prosecuted first for the 1992 murder of Shinda. The DA's office will then request extradition to California to face justice for the murder of Sherry. It is believed that Thomas is a serial killer with more victims during his decades working as a long-haul truck driver.